You're listening to Cash and Sass. I'm Lisa Marie, your go-to gal for all things money. As the Sassy Wealth Queen and the brains behind the Sassy Wealth Coach, I'm here to take you on a thrilling ride from the financial chaos to sassy and sexy money. Welcome back, my sassy friend, for another episode of Cash and Sass Podcast. This is Lisa Marie. I'm your host, and I'm the Sassy Wealth Queen behind the Sassy Wealth Coach. And today, my guest is Karen Roberts. Karen is a seasoned fitness industry veteran with over 25 years of experience who made a bold leap into the digital space After successfully guiding coaches through the transition to online entrepreneurship, she hosted her inaugural online summit in 2020 in the middle of COVID, OMG. Um, Mintwave Radio recognized her expertise and invited her to launch a weekly show, A Coffee with Karen, a cup of positivity with just a sprinkling of woo-woo podcast. Breaking free from the constraints of traditional radio, having interviewed countless coaches, consultants, therapists, and healers, Karen uncovered a common thread, the power of sharing personal stories to expand influence and audience reach. In 2021, she took charge of the station, founding the Raising Vibrations podcast network, driven by the realization that providing a platform was insufficient. Karen identified a need for a comprehensive strategy, leading her to establish the podcast Profit School alongside business partner Evans Putman. Currently residing in the top 1% of podcasts globally, Karen empowers others with coaching services and comprehensive post-production support through her business, ensuring her clients not only reclaim their time, but also achieve a tangible return on investment for their podcasting efforts. Welcome, Karen. Thank you for being a guest on my show. And I have to say, one, I'm impressed that you actually, you know, just jumped in right in the middle of 2020 because, hello, um, that would had to be huge. And we were talking just beforehand, and one of the questions I had for you is um, when I we were talking about, like, the limiting beliefs, and I asked you about the limiting beliefs, one of the things that you said that you used to or maybe sometimes still... Um, Uh, believe is like you don't deserve wealth and abundance and charging higher prices means I'm greedy. Can you explain a little bit more on how that actually feels or felt and what you do to work through that? Well, I think like, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one, you know, Uh, a lot of those probably stem from childhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not that we, I mean, I I was very fortunate. I grew up in a a wonderful home. We lived in a big house. I was adopted as a baby and my parents were very careful with money. So we had, although we had a big house, we never had cash flow, right? We, We never went on expensive holidays. We never had expensive presents. It was always very, my, my dad was uh, an entrepreneur. He was self-employed, but he was always very careful. It was always about saving. And I can remember when they split up, I was probably about 14. And one thing springs to mind when they were sort of divvying up the house, because it was between three of them, my nan lived with us as well. And my mom was mortified that she wouldn't be able to purchase a property that wasn't detached with the money that she would have. And I remember thinking, like, what's the problem? Like, money was never the driving force for me. It was all about being happy. You know, I had a lot of uh, jobs, you know, in my younger years, very sort of menial jobs that I didn't enjoy. Mm -hmm. And to know I am not, not that I'm diagnosed, But through my podcast and learning from coaches, I'm very probably ADHD, which probably fits into that. I was all about having fun and I fell into, I suppose I was lucky enough to find a career that suited my personality. I went into the fitness industry. Money wasn't the driving force. I wanted to enjoy my life and I loved doing what I was doing. I was motivating, inspiring people to create change from a fitness and health perspective. And even though maybe personal training brought in more money, I had a, I wouldn't say big, but I had a fairly big personal training business. I had three trainers working for me. I didn't enjoy it as much. Mm. So I went 
to the I want to I don't want to be teaching fitness you know I was up on stage I, I wanted a big group to get the energy from I was all very much about the energy so money was never a driving force but there was very much a glass ceiling because I used to figure you know what if I can make a living doing this fun thing and making the sort of average income I'm happy. I never really wanted for more until I had kids. <laughs> <laughs> they change everything. <laughs> Don't they just? Um, and before I came, became a single mum. So mm -hmm. about 20 years ago, so my eldest is 24 now, no more, 23 years ago, I was introduced to the self-development arena and I did my first uh program I think it was called uh, you were born rich by Bob Proctor and on that my goal was to own my own fitness studio buy a house and drive a four by four which I'll just put out there was before you know emissions were an issue right so that was my <laughs> that was my goal and I moved to the Algarve Portugal <clears throat> with a four-year-old and seven months pregnant and I always had this attitude of, I'll make it work. You know, I'm, we're not going to starve. I wasn't afraid of taking risks. And because we hadn't researched it, whereas I'm sure many people would research moving abroad and starting again, especially with a four-year-old and a baby, we hadn't. And we realized we couldn't do what we were doing in London, big city. Hello, we're moving to a almost like village type thing abroad. But because of that, the self-development stuff that I was learning, we did. We ended up with a fitness studio for eight years. I bought a house on the back of it. I did get my four by four. I got my... <laughs> <laughs> I got my Mitsubishi truck, my L200. I called, called it my monster truck. But it wasn't sustainable because the business model was wrong. Again, we didn't really think things through. Again, it was all about having fun, but the business had been built around us. So great for the ego, not so good for a scalable business, right? Right. And it, and that's and that's and really important too what you said is because it it was fun and it wasn't sustainable. So, you know, I tell I tell people all the time you need to enjoy what you're doing and it needs to be realistic and be sustainable because if it's not, it's not going to matter if you enjoy and love what you're doing. So you still have to think about the ins and outs of the business. And yes, that involves money. <laughs> um, and, and again, that's the reason why I'm so passionate about us talking about it, because that was something y'all didn't look at. It was something you didn't talk about. Right. And if you would have, I'm not saying you wouldn't have done it. However, you may have realized a way to make it sustainable and more scalable and be able to sustain it and still enjoy it, right? And so I think that's really, really important that, um, that you know, my sassy listeners just grab and go, oh, okay, I want to enjoy it and I still need to be realistic and look at is this sustainable? Can it be scalable? Can it be, you know, long lasting and give me the return that I want? Yeah, sure. It just sort of highlights the importance of having a specific strategy. We didn't. We just wanted, this is what we wanted. We love doing what we were doing. I mean, goodness, if, if I had it now, you know, with the knowledge that I've accumulated, hindsight's a wonderful thing, right? Hindsight's but 2020. Time, <laughs> yeah. At the time, we didn't, and it was just, we're just going to make this work, and it was only really through our, I'd even go as far to say stubbornness. It was, you know, yes, we were consistent. Yes, we were persistent, but I was burnt out, you know? It was, it was, it wasn't, and it, it, again, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for, because... Yes, we loved what we were doing, but it really wasn't. We were always just just getting there, just making enough. 
And yes, we did get what we wanted on the back of that, but it could be done a lot easier if we had the strategy in place. So what was the switch for you? I mean, you went from fitness to podcasting, you know, (laughs) podcast school. I mean, that's like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, there, there was a few steps in between. There was a few steps in between. I moved back to the UK. Ooh, it will be twelve years ago uh, this year. And you know, I've always because I've come from that industry. I was also a sports therapist, so I've I've always, I suppose, wanted to help people. You know, I wanted to fix them. I didn't want them to be in pain. So I've always been self-employed, but I was getting to the age where I was thinking how much longer can I continue this very physically demanding job in both both sides of things realistically? Um, so I had to rethink things. And initially, I, I knew I wanted to be a speaker, I suppose, coming from that teaching environment and motivating and inspiring. The next logical step was to speak. But I, what did I know about online, you know? nothing you know I'm used to jumping around a studio to loud music and having fun so I took what I would consider now looking back I thought I was taking the easy route so I went online and I was selling other people's programs I went into high ticket affiliate programs became a coach and like you said at the beginning about this not feeling worthy I think definitely was there because, you know what, I was brilliant at selling other people's stuff. Making other people Even in the fitness industry, it wasn't my own programs. I was getting the choreography. I was getting the music. I would learn it and then I would go out and teach it. Great. Why? Maybe I didn't trust my own ability. So there was def- I was definitely carrying something in the background from that. So, yeah, I was great at selling other people's stuff. Um, I thought I'd made it. I was having consistent five-figure months, which smashed that glass ceiling that I'd had before. For the first time ever, I was like, oh, it is possible. And then the company shut down overnight. And I got in a lot of debt because I had heavily invested in the company myself. And I made a decision then and there that, I was never going to put all my energy, money, (laughs) effort, hours into something that wasn't for my dream. Amen to that one. And my coach at the time said to me, you know, if you're going to create your own program, it's going to take you three times as long as you think it's going to take. And it's going to cost you three times as much. And he was spot on. (laughs) <laughs> and this was to create what, like a uh, the fitness program or? Well, I had, right, funny you say that because I did originally, this is before COVID. I, again, it's be careful what you, you know, what your dream is because at that point I thought I should, you know, those three words, I thought I should go back to my roots because, you know, a quarter of a century in that world well, um, and and also in your in, I guess in your defense or in your brain, your brain, your n- nervous system is saying this didn't work. Go back to the core because it's safe. And sometimes our nervous system is telling us to do something because quote unquote is safe. When in reality, we need to do the opposite and just remind our nervous system that we're okay. Hundred percent. And it's funny, you know the uh, the universe does definitely push you in in that way and two things happened there so i i went and retrained in uh the ketogenic diet and fasting so completely different to what i'm doing now right because i thought i should go back to the health and wellness didn't want to do the physical stuff and i just launched in the november 2019 uh, my first big event in london speaking on stage about that wanted to do live events (laughs) and then of course the lockdown COVID. happened. Right? <laughs> COVID happened. <laughs> yeah. The drama of, uh, yeah, the last four years. So 
that's when, you know, I'm very much, uh, because things have happened, it's, I haven't had a direct route. It's been very up and down. I've, I've made it, lost it, made it, lost it. And I thought, okay, you know, it's out of our control. What next? And I, I bought a, I invested in a, a program to put on online summits. It wasn't for profit because obviously those times were horrendous. Mm-hmm. And it was just to lift people's spirits. And, and I, I love that though. I love that. What, what could we do? It was like, I didn't, you know, I want to just be stuck at home. It was, it, you know, I needed to do something. And, you know, we're always, as entrepreneurs, we're always constantly learning. And I thought, well, I'll figure it out. You know, I didn't know why I was doing it. It was just, right, I'll learn this. I've got to go online. That was the reality. Um, so, you know, let's start here. And I interviewed 20 coaches from the physical, mental, spiritual perspective. And I just had a fantastic time. Again, the fun aspect. You know, I just enjoyed the whole process. And well, from and not there, like that, but not only that, when you're when you're when you're doing what you were doing, the interviewing and and lifting people's spirits up, that actually also lifts your spirits up and makes it fun. So it makes it enjoyable. And then you start seeing, oh, okay, you know what? Th- that you know what? Something could come of this. Okay. You know, because again, money is important. Yes. Because money is a tool. Money is energy. And whether we like it or not, money is how we can actually make an impact because that is the currency that our world uses. And it's also not the only thing that matters. In order to give and to uplift people and to make an impact, doing something like what you're talking about you did money comes with it do you see what i'm saying it yeah. follows because you're opening it up into the universe and and that's something i have to remind myself quite often and and i'm and i'm and i'm admitting that because again i'm a wealth coach and i don't want people to think oh we work on our money mindset and we work on, we work on all this stuff and then we only have to work on it again that is not the case you and i had this conversation karen right before what you're like i'm still working on it i'm like well guess what <laughs> you will always be working on it because so am i um so i just think it's really important for um that to be uh you know, said and, and heard and, and taken in, but I love, um, how you were doing that. So when you went and did that, what came from it? Because part of that was you were invited to go do this, uh, coffee with Karen and it was with some woo woo involved. And was there some shift in your money mindset and how you thought about, uh, you being worthy in order for you to make that shift into where you're at now? I think so. Again, I was carrying the, I, I'm not worthy, I think, at that time, because it was all about the guest. Mm-hmm. You know, um, again, it's all about me holding a safe space for the guest to share their story. And it was all about lifting them up. It was, all, again, it was always about bigging them up rather than myself. So when I started it, you know, a coffee with Karen, like, what does that even mean? Really? There was no structure. There was no link. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a business at that time. Right. It was just, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Okay. I've been offered a radio. I'm just going to keep going and I'll figure it out. You know, there was no real thought process. I was just keeping doing. I thought I'd learn as I go. And I was interviewing. The reason it was woo woo is because I'd stuck with the summit formula. Coaches from the physical, mental or spiritual perspective. So some of my guests were a little bit woo woo and I didn't want to put people off. So that's why I said it with the sprinkling of woo woo to try and (laughs) introduce maybe some other to to the mainstream. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people, I mean, I think it's all woo woo. Oh, I think it's it's all involved in it. Yeah, very much so. (laughs) We just call it the mental and all the physical, but it's all intertwined. So I I suppose I was still in that mindset. It wasn't about me. And it's interesting what you said earlier, because what I found through interviewing all these different coaches or healers, I found that the more woo-woo ones, 
had very specific money blocks. You could see it because, again, they didn't, oh, they didn't want to talk about money because they wanted to help the world. And there was a definite block there that they didn't see money as this, you know, there's got to be a two-way flow. You know, if, if you talk about it being any, it is energy, right? And it's so energy. if it stops, blocks, it's not flowing. Right. And I found that a lot of the ones who were struggling to get clients, it was because of a poor money mindset and this disconnect between Yes, I want to help people and I want to help people who haven't. Got, well, you've still got to live. You know, your the mortgage <laughs> company still need paying. The electricity still needs paying. You know, you've got to live. Right. So there's got to be an exchange of money. And I, I really do think that a lot of them not coming from a place of, you know, they wanting to help, but they still had this disconnect when they yeah yeah definitely and you know I could still see it in myself too um and it was only really when I thought right you know okay let's get serious now we've got to turn this into a you know I've got to make more money than this right because I was just doing the show and then I was thinking well I can help with the sales side of things because you know I was selling high ticket Affiliate programs, maybe I can create this. And my business was being created, but very disjointedly. It was all over the place and it wasn't in alignment. And it was only really when um, what happened was last year, the end, no, two years ago, um, the owner of the station, well, not two years ago, just over a year ago, sorry, the owner of the station said to me, when your contract's up at the end of the year, I'm giving it up. Do you want it? And I thought, yes, because I, I say <laughs> yes to everything and then figure it out. <laughs> I thought, great, we've got a platform. Now the all these other, they can have their own show and use it as a way to grow their business, right? So again, it was all about them. But I found that many gave up. They didn't, you know, you must know this, a lot, lot, lot of podcasters, they don't even last 10 episodes. And honestly, I've had quite a few that have signed up and they've never even published their first one because overwhelm sets in, they think it was a good idea and then they panic and because there was no strategy. Oh yeah, see, and I had a and I had a strategy, and and for the record, it took me in uh, right before COVID happened. I was thinking, you know, it'd be awesome to have a a podcast about money, and I went and researched, and I was like, and they were all about the investing and how to do this and how to do that, and I was like, no, I, that's not what I want, and I, it wasn't in my brain what exactly I wanted. I just knew it had to be different, and then. COVID happened. And somebody's like, oh, people are launching podcasts. You go launch podcasts. And I said, are you insane? I got two kids who are at home. They're both special needs and they're doing school from, a no. <laughs> Podcast got put on the back burner over here and it stayed there. Um, and then in 2021, it kind of popped up, you know, in the back thing. And I started seeing like what you're talking about, people falling off because they didn't have this strategy. I mean, you saw these, all these ones going up. Now there's some that have stayed, but there are also some that have like, you know, gone. And I was like, no, that when I do this, it's, it's got to mean something and, and it's got to be different. And, um, 2022 eh, it, and then all of a sudden last year, uh, we started talking about it again and then having conversation. And then I was having a conversation with someone that I was connecting with. And she's like, well, where do you want? I said, I want candid conversations. I want money to stop being a taboo. She said, honey, write that down. Write candid conversations. And from there, I started talking to somebody else. We came up with the name Cash and Sass. Uh, and then the candid con and my marketing coach and my mastermind comes up with the uh, candid cash for stations. So instead of conversation, it's cash for stations. And 
from there, I was like, okay, well, I need help because if y'all wait for me to do all of this, it ain't gonna ever happen because there's a lot to it. Yep. This was like birthing a baby for the record, y'all. This was like, I mean, doing it right. It's like birthing a baby because you're, you're in it and you're making sure that you're making those connections and you're making sure that you've got guests lined up before you even go live. And that's the way I wanted to do it. And when you took it over and you had people not showing up, what led to you creating the school? It was really because I was getting to the stage where it was like, oh, my goodness, this person isn't renewing. They've they've given up. I I was like, this isn't working. Something has got to change. And I found this guy who was a coach through a podcast guest, you know, because the beauty is you don't know who's going to come on your show. And I can honestly say that I've just had the best conversations with the most amazing people who are doing phenomenal things within their communities. They're all different, serving different people. They've got different tools in their toolbox. And I just love the conversations because I don't know about you, you could, you know, somebody says, I don't know, they're a mindset coach and you can look on their website and it can be quite fluffy as to what it is. It's like, what is it you do? They, Everyone's talking about the wrong things. It's only when you get them on the show and ask them the questions. And by the end of the show, in my head, I've got a completely different idea as to what is it they do. And this goes back to having a right strategy because nobody wants to hear about what it is I do. I have to share what the promise is. So like for me, I'm just saying like, you know, well, I just help coaches grow their grow their business and have fun through podcasting whilst actually getting back their time. You know, they don't want to hear about getting all back the their time. Stuff. <laughs> I want to hear about getting back the time, but most of the people do not want, I'm analytical, so I'm going to naturally want to know, okay. <laughs> My coach laughs at me all the time because I'm one of the few that will ask those questions <laughs> and it's okay that you don't. And it's okay if I'm more like me and you do, it, but, um, how did it affect your mindset though, especially in the money mindset as you were building this fear initially, I want the listeners to hear that and you still did it because that's the thing. Fear is not supposed to stop you. It's okay to be scared and do it anyway, as long as um, in your gut or your heart, whichever one speaks to you the most, mine's my gut, and 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 you know it and you feel it that it's the right thing, right? Yeah. I, I think that's massive. And I have to say, before, weirdly, before I took on the actual whole station, whole radio station, I had, so when I say that 20 odd years ago, 23 years ago, I did my first You Were Born Rich with Bob Proctor. It must have been around that time that I'd also purchased a book called The Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. And I read it, but I read it once. I read through You Were Born Rich again and again and again and again, repetition, repetition, repetition. Now, in a way, really, I think I should have read The Power of Now. You probably should have read both. (laughs) (laughs) And I bought it, but on Audible, because I'm an audio person, and thank goodness for Audible now. You know, I, I I got rid of a load of books a little while ago, and, you know, everything's on Audible now. So I had it on over and over and over. And I heard something that was obviously always there, but I wasn't ready to hear it. And, you know, I, you know, I would meditate and I would do all this stuff. But what I got from the power of now was rather than like relaxing and almost going to sleep, meditating was actually the opposite. Being ultra aware like, I mean, I would, I would drive and listen to it. And so that sounds dangerous, doesn't it? Driving whilst listening to a meditation. But it was the opposite because the whole focus was to be 
ultra aware of your surroundings. So actually, I was a safer driver because I could drive and be thinking about what I'm going to do for dinner or, you know, stories going through my head. No, this way I was not thinking. And so I call it now I was practicing my unthinking. But I'll be ultra, ultra aware. And from that, that's where the idea came up. I wanted to create a directory for the public to come and find the right fit for them. Because I thought all these coaches that I've interviewed, all doing different things, you may not need a business coach. Maybe you need to deal with some childhood issues or maybe you need to do this or maybe you need to do that, which is going to have, you know, money. Mind maybe you need to sort mm -hmm. your money mindset out before you start a business. And it was only 10 days after that that the owner of the station came to me. So it was a bit like, oh, I'm, I'm on track. Like, the universe, universe was listening. Sort of yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and and that's when you have that inner knowing that you're that you are doing, you know, you are on track. Although the caveat to that is I have given up the radio station and kept the podcast network. And that was more down to we were doing too many different things. Promoting the radio station, their radio shows and their we had to. And, that, and that's possibly my ADHD was. Let's focus on what's working the best. Well, you, you know, scale radio. it. Sometimes yeah. when you scale it, it means scaling back and letting go of something that is too much. So sometimes yes. simplifying things is scaling because then when you simplify and you're able to focus on what's working, you're able to then expand your wealth and grow. Yes. And that's exactly what happened. Because I, I decided I'm going to take on a coach. This is what I love doing. This is what I want to focus on. I'm sort of, I'm nearly there, but I'm not quite. And it was only when I took on a coach, Evans was my coach. And the tweaks were really easy because I'd already been going, you know, two and a half years. And I had this real aha moment. Like, why am I doing all this different stuff? I was, you know, on all social media and creating all these different kinds of posts, value posts, curio. I was busy being busy and I was close to burnout. Mm -hmm. I was doing three shows a week now. I did, for seven months, I did three 60-minute shows a week. Can you imagine all the post-production work? Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> one show a week. <laughs> yeah, I'm back to one show a week now. I, I launch but, one show a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is it. Some of my hosts do once every other week, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's about the consistency, but everything all of a sudden was in alignment. And so then we thought, right, yes, we've got the platform, check. Yes, they can have coaching, check. But the missing thing was the actual implementation of that information. Mm -hmm. And like you just said, it took you quite a while to actually launch your show. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was help people speed up that process. Because, yes, I can remember what it was like in the beginning. And again, you know, they might sort of step out and go, yes, I'm going to do this thing until, you know, it seems like a good idea. And then they hit, I call it the wall of fear where doubt and worry starts to sort of creep in and then they start overthinking and talk themselves out of doing it. And I wanted well, yeah, to... yeah, because one of the ways I talked to myself out of it, one of the first times I talked about it is because when you look, when you go onto social media and you Google it, the rabbit hole that you can end up in around tech and all of that. And then some people just going, oh, just start it and don't worry about what it looks like or feels like and I'm that just didn't resonate with me now that may resonate with some people but it didn't resonate with me and um I was like no because I'm wanting you know I'm wanting this to be different it and I think it needed to wait until now because now is is I think people are ready to listen to and and having different ideas and recognizing that there are some taboo subjects that really need to start being talked about and money is just one of them. I mean, hello, we are in 2024. Money needs to be discussed, period. 
Um, and I also knew I wasn't going to do it by myself. I made the investment. Again, money. Had to have a strategy. Okay, who am I going to hire? And then I made sure I hired who I needed. Okay, I'm. I don't want to do the tech. I don't want to know. I don't want to do. I'll make decisions on what platforms we're using, but I don't want to do the back end stuff. I don't want to know anything about it. And having that, sometimes making investments is just what you need to catapult your business. Um, and be able to expand and have that growth. And a lot of times having a money block will stop you from making that investment. Oh. And, and you know, or for example, the investment in the microphone or the investment in what you need. And one of the things that I loved about mine is I was like, okay, look, I don't want the most expensive thing out there because hello, this is brand new. We can always upgrade. And... I also don't want to start off with the cheapest thing that's not going to work. So he did his research and came back and gave me a list of the things I needed to buy. And honestly, ended up not being that expensive at all. And so I had, I knew what I needed to do. Okay, this is investment. So sometimes we have to reach out and ask for that help and work through that block of, do I really have to make this investment? or when they have a block, it's, do I really have to spend this money? And when you look at it as an investment in expanding your business and expanding that growth, a lot of times the investment's worth it. A hundred percent. But it's, I think it's can be very scary for an entrepreneur mm -hmm. because you can get to a point and if, 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 if you've got just enough money coming in to pay you, pay your expenses. It's like to jump to that next level. When are you going to make that jump to maybe outsource some of the stuff to give you back your time? Because we know is you, it, you is can it gonna tip, Is it going to tipsy side the, the revenue? Hello, I understand that completely because that's what I've been going through for the last five or six months. So I yes. completely, and it is, it's very, very scary. And you have to bring yourself back to the tools that you have and and be strategic in the process of, okay, I'll make this investment now. What can we do to where we don't have to make this much of an investment until we get something back so that you're still able to pay yourself? And that's part of what I work with with my clients as a, because I'm, I work with my clients as a CFO slash wealth coach. So I'm working with them on their mindset and their strategy so that they're not getting that block and they're not making so much of a huge investment that it bites them on the butt. Oh, it's so important because otherwise, mm -hmm. like I would say all pretty much all my other businesses, just because I've been, I mean, I've been self-employed since I was 19 years old. You know, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 19. But the truth of it is I was not a business owner. I had bought myself a full-time job. Plus, I mean, trust me, when we launched the fitness studio, we were the front of house, we were the cleaners, we were this, we were working ridiculous. We'd bought ourselves more than a full-time job, which why I say it wasn't sustainable. Yeah, because you weren't investing in other people to do what they're good at. No, so and we couldn't back. because we'd built the business around us. The moment we tried to bring other people in, you know, our members weren't happy because they wanted us. And that's why I say that's ego. Um, not that it, it didn't come from that place, but we realized, oh, my goodness, we've set this up all wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think for any entrepreneur, if you really, really want to create a business, you're not going to do it by yourself. There's not enough time in the day. Like you said, there's lots of things going on behind this even with the online world, you know, I jumped into this because I thought, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have the laptop lifestyle and I can do what I want. And <laughs> I'm going to have all this time. You're like, you're joking. I was working 16 hour days and working seven days a week. And, but you, ha I mean, I, I get it. You have to start somewhere in, mm -hmm. in hindsight, if I had really believed in myself and didn't have that I'm not worthy story going on in the background, I would have just gone and got funding in the beginning and gone all in. 
I didn't. And and I think people don't because there is that little bit of fear. You think, I'm going to dip my toe in the water. I'm going to give it a go. Well, that kind of attitude actually. And a lot of times too, especially with women entrepreneurs, is we're afraid of going to get funding because maybe we made some money mistakes and our credit's not as great. Or we're afraid we're going to be denied for whatever reason. And then what, right? You know, I started my business with less than nothing. (laughs) Um, I laugh about it now, but it wasn't a laughing moment back then. Um, And it was in 2016. I had spent over 20 something years in corporate um, and I was let go. And I had made the decision then that I was done with the migraines. I was done with the tension headaches. If I was going to barely make ends meet with my two girls. I was doing it on my terms so that I had time back. So to me, freedom and time was the currency that I needed. Okay, fine. If I can't, you know, because I was working 50 hours a week and I was barely making ends meet. So, and I had to make time up every time I had to take time off to go take one of my curls to the doctor or whatever. And so I think it's important that, you know, um, and at first I did, I tried to do everything. And then the first thing I hired was someone to make the graphics because me and Canva do not get along. (laughs) I'm with you. There is a love hate relationship with that software. And it was, I would either post and I wouldn't be able to keep up with the clients and the work I was doing, or I was keeping up with the clients and the work and I wasn't posting and I was, because I, I would end up, it would take me hours to create like one or two images. And I know there are some listeners that are listening to this going, hours, I can spit them out in 10 minutes. Mm, I love you. I envy you. (laughs) Go for it. (laughs) I, I have Canva. I pay for it. I literally go on there maybe a couple of times to find something or make a slight tweak to something that's already been created by my team. My team goes into my Canva. (laughs) Um, Same as that. Same as that. And that gave me time back, right? Because the VA I invested in was able to create images, 10, 20 images, whatever, in two hours that I was, that I would be taking two hours to create one and get frustrated and not do. So sometimes the return on investment is your time. And I think that's important because that's one of the things that you realized was, okay, I'm burning myself out. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not thinking I'm worthy enough one to have help. And I think that's one of the things that we have to, um, one of the things in our money mindset that we have to shift because in order to be sustainable, it's okay to have help. It's okay to have coaches. It's okay to have people on behind you on the scene. Cause I'm gonna tell you now, the people I've got on my team, they're behind the scenes. This podcast wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for them, okay? Because all the stuff that goes into it, and yes, it's an investment. The person who makes my reels, the pers- the my tech team, the ones that do the graphics, which is part of the tech, all of that stuff, there's things that are being done on behind the scenes that makes, um, that gives me my time, and I can concentrate on my zone of genius. Yes, I, I, you well, and you just hit the nail on the head there. You focus on your what what is and and so everybody's going to be different. So like you said, mm-hmm. some people are amazing at Canva, so you don't need help with Canva. Focus on your zone of genius and then outsource the rest. But I also think as women, you know, I'm a mother, two girls, but they are older now, and I think there is sometimes a bit of a mental block in. Oh, well, if I ask for help, that means I'm a failure in some way. Again, all these stories. Especially for women. Create, yes. 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 Very much so. And we don't want to ask for help. But actually, y- you don't know where some of the help. I mean, I've had two co- actually of my coaches. The guy that told me well, it's going to take you three times as long to create this and cost you three times as much. At one point, he wanted to come into my business. But it wasn't the right thing. He had slightly different ideas to me. And I thought, no, no, Karen. It's not in alignment. It's not, it if it's to be, not in alignment. It, it and I love him. be in alignment. Yes. It's got to be the right thing. Um, and then this latest coach, you know, I took on a coach. And then we've 
uh, he's invited me to come into his business to grow the the podcast profit school. So, you know, ask for help. There is nothing wrong in asking for help. I don't know anybody, I don't know if you do, that has, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying I've made it, made it. I've got a long way to go. I've got big goals. But I don't know anybody who I would consider has made it that hasn't had help. Nobody does it by themselves. And I'm actually going to tell you that for as a woman, especially for a long time, asking for help was hard for me. <laughs> um, it's it's I've come a long, long way. <laughs> it's sometimes still hard. And I've come a long way and I'm not afraid to ask for help as much now. And and one of the things that as you were talking and I was just thinking about it, I've come farther from asking for help and leaning into the people who have that zone of genius and giving me the help than I would have if I wouldn't have asked for help. Oh. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I think that's important because even my coach who he's, he's made it further than me is what I would call it. Right. And he still says he's got a ways to go because he's got big dreams. He's wanting to change the world. He wants to make a huge impact, which is the same thing I want to do. And he even said when he started asking for help, that's when things started happening. And so I think it's important um, that we as women realize that when we ask for help, it doesn't mean we can't do it. It doesn't mean we're not good enough and it doesn't mean we're a failure. It simply means we're asking for help to get us from here to here. And a lot of times that help is going to take something off of you that's going to give you your time back that you can focus on your zone of genius so that you can um, do what I call create, retain, and expend wealth. Yeah. And you're going to get there a lot faster. You're just oh, amen get, to that I'm, one. I'm going to be 52 in a, in a couple of months. It's like, you know. I, 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 I'm going to be 51 I'm, in July. So... <laughs> So yeah, I'm we I'm I'm, 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 got it. <laughs> I'm like all in. I, I'm I'm getting there faster. I've only just become a digital nomad as of October last year because my girls have grown and flown. Yeah, the mine nest aren't. My, like, mine are twenty and twelve. So <laughs> you've got a I had them late. <laughs> I had them later in life. <laughs> you you got a way to go, but it's you know but yes. it, this is the thing. It gives you the freedom to choose Mm -hmm. it's the freedom it's not necessarily about the money it's about what that money can do it gives you choice Mm -hmm. not everybody wants to travel I've always wanted to travel I've spent probably half of my adult life abroad I, I had said to my daughters I'm not doing another winter in the UK and I'm still here and it's February because I'm helping out my eldest who's 24 but <laughs> they know this is the last one. You know, I'll be off soon. So I will come um, and visit you when it is not 20 degrees below zero. <laughs> See, I, yeah, love tra- I-, I love traveling and I will not do it anywhere cold during the winter. And see, and I can't say that because I was actually supposed to be going to Whistler uh, a few weeks ago and I had to cancel at the last minute. But I was going to be and I told my coach that he needed to understand <laughs> The fact that I was going to Whistler in February, he needed to realize what how much that meant. I trusted him and like I valued his work because I don't do I don't do the cold. Okay, the cold. Um, no, I live in the not, south. It's not for me. I, I need the sunshine. I should be in Mexico right now. That was yes. the plan. Yes, that was the plan. I should be in Mexico right now. <laughs> I need some sunshine, but for so, so for so for others, you know they don't. They might not want to ever do that. But the point right. is, and just is when like you... speaking on stages is something you want to do, and it's something I want to do, and it may not be something that someone else wants to do. Is it the money and being able to make that impact and create that wealth? Get, the money is energy. It gives you a choice. It gives you, um, especially if you are able to uh, work through those money blocks. It gives you uh, the tool 
to be able to make the impact and make those choices. Yeah. I, I think that is the major thing. It's all about, you know, what is it you want? What is exactly. it you want? The money is going to give you, but we all need to, you know, and I, I, like I said right at the beginning, I'm still working on my money blocks. I know they're still there. Um, and it is something that you've got to continually work on. You know, uh, once I sort of got over some of it and realized that, yes, I can charge a higher premium and I'll over deliver. It's all about, well, I'll give more, but that fear of, you know, because I would be thinking, oh, I want to help these people that are just starting out just because I can remember what I was like, oh, if somebody had helped me. Uh, but th that's all scarcity mindset. It's all scarcity mindset. You can still help people. You and still charge a higher premium for the ones who yes. are further along. Yeah, it's something and that's I've your business. It's your business. Right. You could always give extra help. Or again, you know, now what we tend to do is rather than just provide the platform, we're giving more help so that they're more successful quicker. So then they're more likely to stay because if we just gave them the minimum, they were by themselves and they've given up. So that didn't right. work, did it? Right, right. Tell our listeners um, what um, uh, you said that you had something for our listeners, which will be in the show notes. Can you tell them about that, what that is? Well, that's our free. We do a, a monthly free workshop and it's really just for, you know, I mean, it is for everybody. However, what we focus on is if you're a coach or an expert, specifically if you have some kind of high ticket offer, if you like the idea of having a podcast, you actually can use it as the driving force behind your leads and sales. If you are a little bit tired of being all over the place in your business and constantly on social media, because again, going back to be careful what you wish for, Right. I was teaching this organic marketing on social media and you've got to do this and you've got to do all these different posts and, you know, do slide into DMs. And and then guess what happens if it works? You are constantly, constantly on your phone, dealing with notifications, jumping on discovery calls with people who really aren't a good fit. And and that's what I mean, where I I felt I was close to burnout because I was trying to keep up. I was using Trello boards to try and organize like who I'd spoken to and have I followed up with enough. And I was just all over the place and I just felt I was a slave to my calendar. Now, yeah, I mean, I yes, I get paid for showing up on my podcast. I can't retire yet on that, just on that income alone. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you can see where it's heading. And then now all I do is turn up, I do a monthly workshop. It's really to just give people the blueprint, you know, because like you said, there's so many moving parts and that's what puts people off. So we want to just sort of showcase what is possible, especially if you're selling high ticket stuff and give them the blueprint so that they walk away. When you have clarity of that, okay, what does this actually look like? How can I use this to give me back my time? Because yes, it has given me back my time. We don't do a pitch. There's no offer stack at the end of it. There is an invitation to work with us because really all we do is the implementation of that blueprint. Okay. So for a lot of people, you know, when they're overthinking and recording and re-recording their first podcast because they're panicking. Again, I try to eliminate all of that because when we run our implementation days, I co-host their first podcast. So we give them our formula because there, we do have a specific formula that can be used for whether you're guesting on podcasts, whether you're hosting your own solo show or whether you're interviewing others, we have a very specific formula. And yeah, you can go and watch YouTube videos and find out different things. You can read a book about it. 
but it's about the doing it. And that's mm-hmm. the, the step that I wanted to overcome for people is when you do it and you experience it yourself, then you get it and that you're more likely to keep doing it. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Very much so. So I co-host their first one so that when they come to the implementation day, which is always couple two weeks after, at least two weeks after, to give us time to do all the post-production stuff, we actually launch their podcast channel on that day. We go through absolutely everything so that they can see what needs to be done and they can either do it themselves or we can take care of the post production. So it's it's really taking somebody from a blueprint mm-hmm. to okay, are you ready? Let's stop procrastinating. Let's stop overthinking it. Let's just get on and do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So, sometimes sometimes ripping the band-aid off is a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what Absolutely. I say. It's okay, it's time to rip that band-aid off. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Because coaching is great. And, you know, Mm -hmm. yes, there is the option for ongoing coaching. But uh, what I found personally, and it might not be the same with everybody else, but it was just like, they're still not taking action. Well, what is what is stopping you? It's the overthinking and overanalyzing. And And come on. Right. And sometimes people need um, the coaching and the help with some of the implementation so that they get out of their heads, right? Yes. So, um, thank well, you. We're always in our heads. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're our- so we're not in our heads as much. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's one of the things I tell my coach. It's like I've been in my head too much. I need to get out of my head. <laughs> it's dangerous when I'm in there too long because I start yes. overthinking. Um, practice. Um, I, that's when I always come back to. I've got to practice my un like shush, Karen, men- verbally. And mentally, yep, everything flows a lot easier. Yep, yeah, that's some. That's one of the things I'm learning is uh, it's is it's great that I'm analytical and I need to learn to be able to, like you said, mentally and verbally. A lot of times, I'll this verbally, but mentally in here, it is going ninety miles an hour, and that's even more dangerous. Um, Thank you very, very, very much for being on my show. I truly appreciate it. I hope that you, my sassy friend, enjoyed this conversation, candid conversation of money and the money mindset and seeing what's possible and that it's okay that you have these dips and these ups and dips and ups and dips because in the end, you can still end up being where you're you're supposed to be and it's okay to ask for help. So until next time, my sassy friend, remember to stay sassy. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Cash and Sass. Check us out on social media and on our website at www.thesassywealthcoach.com where you can download my free Money Story Start Guide. The website again is www.thesassywealthcoach.com. And as always, subscribe to the show to catch every new episode and leave us a review so we can continue to bring you fresh content. And remember, yes, it is possible to have sassy and sexy money. See you next week.